Well, hello and welcome everybody again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. And I'm really pleased today to have Doeg Khan from Red Hat. He is the practice lead for application migration and modernization, um, which is a big title for someone who is really um, got a lot of hands-on experience with customers and helping them um, make their deployments of OpenShift work. And we asked him here to give his um, thoughts on moving from legacy to cloud native. And he sort of identified three patterns of modernizing um, applications that I thought were really insightful. I saw him give this talk internally, and I'm really pleased to have him here to give this to the OpenShift Commons community. So without any further ado, um, you can ask questions in the chat. There'll be room and time at the end for Q&A. So um, I'll let Zoe introduce himself and take it away. Thank you, Diane. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Diane said, um, I am the practice lead in Red Hat Consulting for application migration and modernization. And um, today I'm going to be talking about um, the journey from legacy to cloud native, uh, especially when you have a large portfolio of applications and how we can actually navigate through that uh, and um, you know modernize the, the portfolio. Uh, there are three patterns that uh, we have identified by working with various customers in the field, and I'm happy to present on this topic for you. So let's get started. Um, so uh, first, um, just a little bit of background with respect to the, the adoption um, uh, of, of emerging technologies uh, by enterprise customers. Uh, this is um, uh, from the enterprise IT adoption, um, which, which, which they track how enterprises actually adopt um, emerging technologies. Um, so one of the key trends that they have pointed out was um, enterprises actually are towards the maturity cycle of their uh, technology option in, 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 in most of the cases. Uh, reason is that um, you know, there are companies, there are uh, companies who experiment with the technology, uh, but most of the enterprise IT wants to adopt technologies um, you know, when they have a clear ROI uh, you know, in front of them. Uh, based on you know what they are looking at, so um, you know I, I was just going to talk about why does it happen? Uh, why do we see enterprise IT? Um, you know I don't want to call them laggards, but obviously they are not the 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 uh, you know the the first starters either. Um, so typically the dynamics in the enterprise IT, the way it works is that um, they are mostly aligned with the business mission, uh, and IT is generally considered as a cost center. Uh, which is an enabler. Um, for most emerging tech, ROI is usually unknown in the beginning. Um, so, you know, if you take out Facebook, Google, Yahoo, and, um, you know, uh, Amazon, for example, um, the rest of the companies usually want to adopt, uh, you know, something, um, you know, when they know pretty much what are the use cases that they can address with them and what is the clear ROI. Um, so, um, you know, majority of the times, um, you know, uh, these shops adopt, uh, you know, emerging tech at, at a significant maturity uh, of that, if not, uh, you know, uh, towards the end. Uh, there are a few other things that are also critical as part of the enterprise IT, uh, you know, organization. There are skill sets that people have that they want to continue to use and continue to apply. Um, and um, we have seen that whenever we talk to the customers, um, they would want to do the same thing, uh, even in the cloud realm, uh, you know, want to use the same languages, same procedures, uh, but obviously with the new flavor. Uh, there are existing processes that, um, you know, uh, add to organizational inertia. And obviously there are existing systems that these companies have um, that, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, introduce uh, inertia in terms of, um, you know, uh, momentum when we talk about adopting, uh, you know, newer technologies. Um, on the other hand, um, the business is constantly pushing, um, you know, IT to move faster with less. Um, there's a pressure to reduce cost. And generally, the trend is moving towards how can we do more with less. So this creates um, a fundamental conundrum, um, you know, when the uh, the IT shops where you know if you look at the amount of resources you know and and money they have, generally the 70% uh, of that is allocated towards maintenance, uh, while 30% is towards innovation or new things. 
Um, this is um, a generalization. Obviously, we, we have seen numbers as 80, 20, 90, 10, um, but we haven't seen 50, 50. Uh, reason is that most of the IT spend generally goes towards ELAs, um, you know, towards uh, maintaining uh, the current systems, keeping the lights on, that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, you know, this equation sort of tells us that uh, you know, the, most of the money and resources are dedicated to keeping the status quo. Um, and one of the things that prompted me to think about this is what if we can help the customer change the situation in such a way that even if we move the needle, maybe 10% towards the innovation, those are real resources, real money, real, real stuff that customers can use um, to develop new processes, to develop new systems or enhance new systems, take care of technical debt, and sort of start look, looking at modernization as a real thing uh, in order to imp improve the productivity um, you know, of their shops. Uh, and that was one of the key drivers of introducing modernization at that scale uh, for the entire IT portfolio. Um, I'm uh, gonna briefly talk about this. Um, where we talk about CIOs and TTOs, um, their main challenges are uh, among many, uh, you know, how do they rebalance and maintain innovation? So uh, based on the previous slide that I mentioned, uh, you know, uh, this is obviously a struggle. Um, also to avoid vendor lock-in uh, and uh, in the licensing model. So, you know, granted that you bought a piece of software 10 years ago and now it's commoditized, but you're still locked into a proprietary vendor. Um, you know, there's no reason for you to not move to open source equivalent, uh, you know, after a long period of time when you have already paid a lot to, uh, you know, proprietary vendor. Um, also, um, uh, become more productive with lightweight technology, especially the technology that is going to be more nimble and allow you to move faster to the cloud native architecture. Uh, you cannot necessarily take your heavy systems, um, you know, in, in the cloud, uh, you know, uh, if you want to go more, uh, agile, um, and also, uh, you know, adopt new processes and technology. So the, these are the key challenges that CIOs and CTOs uh, face today. But the, but the underlying theme of all this is um, how do they actually rally their troops and, uh, you know, uh, put a structured plan in place to modernize their portfolio that will allow them to realize um, these, these um, challenges, uh, you know, solve these challenges. So, um, uh, you know, the, um, why should we even care about modernization? You know, what's, what's, what's really the value of it? Uh, first of all, you know, modernization enables experimental approach to product development. Um, this has long been a challenge in a typical enterprise where we see the typical release cycles are anywhere from six months to nine months. We, we, we generally see one release a year, um, maybe two uh, for a large portfolio of systems. And they generally go through a very large funnel of, you know, synchronization where a lot of environment is locked down for, you know, a single release of multiple systems at the same time. Uh, if we contrast that with an approach where the organizations can actually experiment and get something in the hands of the user quickly and get the feedback to refine their offering, um, that's usually, you know, uh, considered as a monumental task. Um, most companies are not even ready. So one of the key benefits uh, of modernization uh, is that it allows them, it enables them to not only think in that direction, but also realize that potential. Um, there's, uh, it also has a good side effect of creating high performance teams that improve the quality of work. And, you know, frankly, people like to do this kind of stuff uh, that uh, helps in terms of recruiting and retaining, you know, good talent. Uh, and generally, you know, drives the overall improvement in quality. Some of the key things um, that modernization drives are, uh, you know, frequent deployments. Uh, the rate of frequent deployment goes up. Um, it, there's a faster time to recovery from failures. So if, let's say, in a typical six months release cycle, if something critical goes down uh, or does not work out and we realize as part of production deployment, then usually the entire release is backed out. So if this touches 10, 15, you know, seven, eight, 10, whatever systems, all those systems are gonna be impacted one way or the another. another. Uh, whereas uh, when we look at modernization, um, it gives you a framework. I'm gonna show you how. It gives you a framework 
uh, in terms of, uh, you know, to allow you to isolate your failures and be able to recover from it very easily. Also, it uh, leads to shorter lead times. So if the business comes up with an idea that they want to get out quickly, they really don't have to wait for six months. Uh, and then also lowers the failure rate change. Um, so these are some of the key benefits uh, that why we should consider modernization. Um, there are organizational aspects to it. So, you know, it's not going to be just technology enabled, but the whole idea is that we use technology as the enabler and put a structure in place that would allow organizations to actually do it in a more structured fashion. So, um, this is one of my favorite slides that I talk about with my customers. Um, so, if you, if, you, if you go on the left, uh, we look at, you know, we started with application lifetimes where it took months uh, or, or even years to develop the systems and years and decades to run them. So those systems, um, you know, obviously we're talking about systems that have been developed you know, 20, 25 years ago or, or even longer. Um, and uh, the life cycles of those systems were, were very long, um, you know, um, before they were considered for any type of significant change. Um, as we move forward, uh, you know, we have gone from, you know, um, years and months of development to weeks and months of development and uh, systems now run from months to years before they are considered for a big change. Uh, and the latest trend is, you know, um, it, the, the business wants everything out in days in a matter of weeks, even like, you know, three, three weeks, four weeks, let's say. And uh, then, um, you know, the, the, the system is out there. Um, you know, we're talking about apps, uh, iPhone apps, you know, mobile apps, uh, integration points, uh, you know, web apps, for example, that uh, real customers are using. Uh, and suddenly we want to introduce new changes uh, as a result of that in a matter of weeks even. Um, so these are the dynamics that um, uh, that exist today. And inherently they are pushing us to look at deeply across development processes, application architectures, deployment packaging, and application infrastructure. So um, if you look across the board, um, you know, back in the day, we were using waterfall, uh, developing monolithic type of systems deployed on physical servers, run in a single data center. Um, uh, you know, uh, as we made our transition from, uh, uh, you know, decades to years, um, we have changed a few things. Uh, we have adopted virtual servers, for example, uh, data centers are still around. Um, we have moved from monolithic to end tier systems, um, and we uh, most organizations are either in the process or have a flavor of agile now in place. Um, but as we continue to push the envelope, and you know, uh, when the demand is increasing so much that you know um, we need to get something out the door in a matter of days, uh, we need to look at you know what processes are going to enable that, uh, what application architectures. Um, are the ones that align with that kind of approach uh, and also similarly packaging and, and the application infrastructure. This is not meant to be all in or nothing kind of proposition. So for example, uh, we still have customers that are deploying monolithic applications on virtual servers that is still possible, that is still viable. Um, but the general idea is that eventually when we have to move in this direction, we have to look across the board and see how we can actually align our efforts in terms of all these verticals um, so that we can maximize our potential. Um, and it is a journey and every organization has to figure out their own path uh, you know, uh, through that journey. Um, so let me give you an example of, I told you about how, how the typical release cycle work. So over here, we are looking at uh, monolithic release cycles and um, generally, um, you know, uh, we have a release plan that governs multiple systems. And part of that is, you know, when the release plan is scheduled uh, for uh, analysis and, the, the, you know, uh, development, uh, we have several teams that go in parallel and start the development effort. Um, you know, if there's, this is one system or multiple systems, you know, the, the tendency is that we can staff one or more developers to make modifications to one or more systems at the same time. Uh, you know, given that this release plan touches all these components. Um, but then something weird happens, which is um, these, everything has to be synchronized for integration testing, QA testing, and UAT testing, which means that there are environments that are locked down 
nobody's allowed to make a change and things have to be synchronized and sequenced very carefully so much so that if if one database is not available then it has a potential of holding up the entire release train um and uh, and and once these activities are done then finally the deployment can go to production um now let's say if you find bugs uh, if you find bugs in the, as part of the development that's the most cheapest to fix in terms of time and money but if you find bugs in integration qa or let's say uat which is usually the last step uh, then you know it has to go back to the developers and get it fixed but there's a cost associated with it the cost of time cost in terms of environment, cost in terms of people's time. Um, so the cost actually slightly increases if the bugs are found, you know, after the de development cycles. And then, yeah, you know, extrapolate that if we find bugs in production, you know, the cost is even higher because then we are looking at hard fix or some kind of a patch deployment that will then hold uh, the, the, the subsequent release and also impact people's schedules because now this has to be fixed in production right away and everything has to drop and this is this becomes the priority by the way this entire set of activities span typically six months to nine months in a typical enterprise and that's what we continue to see now contrast that with um, a microservices based release cycle um, obviously i'm making a lot of generalizations here but the idea over here is to present that when we talk about um, you know, modernization uh, and going cloud native. Uh, one of the key things um, that we consider is to have microservices based architectures. And what they allow us to do is uh, something very, uh, you know, um, um, uh, something very uh, phenomenal, which is called independent deployability. Um, so typically the systems can go be governed with their own individual release plans. And so that's number one. So we, we basically decouple uh, you know, the release releases of systems and, uh, you know, take out the unnecessary dependency so that each system can actually march at their own pace, granted that they have to implement, you know, similar type of mandates from the business or new functionality, but the release can be decoupled. So there's no need to synchronize at the release planning side. side. Um, on the development side, you know, there's a plethora of options to choose the development languages. So some systems can continue to remain in Java if that's the key technology. Others can be, uh, you know, uh, developed in Node.js, Python. Um, so for example, if you want to experiment quickly, uh, you want to see, you know, get something out the door. Uh, sometimes Node.js can get you those cycles quickly and get to the 1.0 release quite fast. And that's probably the team that you may want to have to get ideas out quickly to test that uh, and be able to get the feedback. And once it um, matures to a degree that it now becomes an enterprise system, you can then decide to actually rewrite in Java or any other technology that you may steam uh, appropriate. But the whole idea is that these systems can now uh, go to production independent of each other um, while the old system continues to run. And one of the benefits that we see as a, as a result of this is, let's say if a bug is found in one of the systems, then it can be patched for that particular system without impacting the others. So there is no need to synchronize the environments. As you can see, there's no need to hold up other uh, people's releases, other systems releases, uh, because you know we don't have one single database that locks everybody down, or we don't have one environment anymore that locks everybody down or we don't have one uh, you know, uh, thing uh, or one team anymore that locks everybody down. Uh, so we have potentially scaled up uh, by adopting this new architecture, new way of uh, you know, writing cloud native applications in such a way that gives us flexibility to deploy independently. And this is one of the key benefits that most um, customers don't realize at the onset that uh, in order for you to be able to release quickly, uh, independence is key. So uh, just wanted to highlight that, you know, this is one of the key benefits that, um, you know, uh, is part of the modernization. Now, um, we all have hundreds of systems running in production, right? We're not going to shut them down and suddenly start rewriting them from scratch and, you know, tell the business, hey, we're not going to do anything for the next nine months or a year. Uh, you just pay us and we're just going to continue to build the new systems. That's never going to happen. 
So what what do you do, let's say, when you are, have a large portfolio of legacy applications that is delivering value in the business um, and, and it's critical to the business flows, but you still have to modernize, you still have to move forward, you still have to leverage the benefits of modernization to deliver faster and everything else that comes with it. Uh, you know, um, so let's talk about a structured approach of how to move forward with it. And this is a distillation of, um, you know, of, of our work that we have done with various customers in the field. So um, there are three main patterns that we have identified um, that I'm going to talk about um, in detail. Um, so uh, the idea is that um, when we deal with the application portfolio, we can actually analyze that portfolio and be able to apply one or more of these patterns so that we can, um, in a structured fashion, develop a capability that allows um, the app team uh, or an app dev manager, if he has 10, 15 systems, or a VP who has you know, hundreds of systems, or a CTO who has even hundreds and thousands of systems, uh, put a very structured approach in place. Um, so the three patterns are lift and shift, augment, and complete rewrite. Um, so let's see what they look like uh, in action. So I'm going to move to this slide. Um, um, so the whole idea is that you have a defined starting point and you have a defined point of maturity for your modernization needs. Um, um, so uh, in this slide, you can see the three steps uh, that I presented. Um, the idea is that uh, these are three steps, but they, they, they can be four steps, five steps. The idea is that there is a starting point, there are some intermediate points on the way, and there is a point of maturity that we want to realize. So generally for lift and shift, we start with a set of systems that are cleanly architected, um, have clear separation of concerns. And in terms of our target state, um, you know, um, uh, for cloud native, we recommend um, you know, uh, developing towards microservices type of application architectures deployed on some kind of a container platform um, that will allow you to grow uh, you know, dynamically. Um, so the idea is that you basically wrap your microservices in a self-deployable units that um, wrap the data and configuration and everything goes together. Um, so there's no more shared databases. There's no more shared configurations. Um, the, the, the entire idea is that this is independently deployable. So let's see how that looks like and how do we actually go from, uh, you know, starting point to the point of maturity. So the first step in the lift and shift is um, we lift the existing runtimes into containers, um, but we leave the the harder bits, which are the data, the configuration, the messages, where they are. So in the first step, uh, we are going to take, you know, in this particular example, I'm showing that application, which is cleanly architected with UI, business logic, and persistence. That was the typical architecture that everybody was developing back, you know, 10 years ago, for example. Um, so if you have this kind of separation or uh, even better, you have uh, clean separation in terms of uh, with, you know vertical entities. Um, you can actually easily lift them into containers and deploy them into containers while continue to use your Oracle or Sybase or you know SQL Server or whatever um, you know wherever they are. So what we are do saying is that we are being very explicit in the first step where you you make an effort to wrap your container runtime your runtimes. Uh, and run them into a container on a pass platform, uh, but you you don't touch the harder bits uh, so that you do not introduce um, you know a, a massive change upfront. Um, this paradigm will allow you to get to get into a position where you can now quickly iterate and um, you know improve your system uh, while continuing to deliver business value. So we are not telling the business that we are shutting down the systems for eight months, nine months, year, whatever, and not delivering any value. In fact, we are what we are doing, or we are showing them that we are continuing to deliver new functionality, new business value, or maintain existing value. And at the same time, we are you know, taking step-by-step -step approach to modernize uh, you know, our system. Um, one of the key benefits of this first step is that we introduce a new development uh, and ops methodology that will train uh, the development team and the ops team to be able to deal with um, cloud native uh, application 
uh, deployments down the line. So this is where we introduce our uh, fully automated CI CD tool chain. This is where we introduce our you know, um, uh, container-based development workflows. This is where we introduce disposable environments that can be stored up, let's say, with OpenShift. Um, and that will allow teams to scale independently, um, you know, without, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, choking everyone at the same time. So we have, you know, but just with this single step, we have actually eliminated so many, you know, uh, choke points in the release train that, uh, you know, the business can see the value right away. Now the next step quickly is as part of the step two. Uh, so now, since we are already running in a container platform, we have the automated tooling in place. We are able to now, you know, take piece by piece and, um, you know, deploy that in a microservices architecture. Uh, now this approach will require some deliberation, some re-architecture, um, some, you know, in some cases we have to a little bit of be careful and, and rewrite the pieces that does not that do not make sense. But the whole idea is now that we are enabled to move faster, we can actually take the time to to do this, even on a regular release schedule. Uh, because you know, we can open a change request that says, okay, we are going to develop microservices X as part of this release cycle. And that release cycle will also provide business um, new functionality. Um, so as you can see that this becomes a repeatable approach that can be applied. And the beauty is that um, this becomes uh, a very fast way for us to move forward. And I'm going to compare um, our approaches uh, in a minute. Um, next, um, so next pattern is uh, what I call augment. Uh, we have heard about augmented reality. Uh, well, we are sort of augmenting our reality over here by applying this pattern. So um, uh, let's imagine we have uh, systems that are monolith. There, there are systems that everybody's scared of. Sometimes these are mainframe systems. Sometimes these are systems that are developed over a period of years, 20, 25 years, that people are scared to touch. They don't want to make changes. Um, some of them have uh, business logic and stored procedures even. Um, you know, so if you, if, you, if you touch one part of the system, then something else breaks somewhere else. But the business is demanding that um, we integrate with mobile or we integrate with our partners, we integrate with Salesforce and other systems. Um, so we are in this um, you know, uh, situation where we cannot move forward, but we have to move forward, right? So the way we approach this is, uh, let me just go through the steps for this one. So, so the first step um, in this particular situation is, uh, while we are augmenting our reality is, uh, you know, we, we, we recommend that we do not do anything to the current running system. Just leave it where it is because generally people are familiar with how to manage its start and stop and how to manage its errors. So it, it has gone through the level of maturity in the organization in terms of management. Uh, what we recommend is continue to run the system where it is, uh, but do two things. Um, make two incisions. Um, uh, so the first incision is to expose the functionality, um, uh, and the second one is to expose the data. What this allows you to do is um, call the functionality from the outside. So this could be your web service that you write that wraps, uh, you know, a call to the mainframe. This could be your uh, messaging-based, uh, um, you know, invocation that you send a message, and then there's an adapter that you write that talks to the mainframe, let's say, and gives you the response back. And let's say your mainframe is responsible for order booking or patient records or you know whatever is relevant to your um, you know uh, business need. Uh, so suddenly, what you have done is you have exposed a set of services that can now be called from the outside uh, using an integration technology such as Fuse. Um, you know, um, and uh, you have uh, enabled yourself to um, you know um, use the legacy as a backend now. Um, and the second part is that you can also query, submit query requests that give me all the customers that has property X, for example. So, you know, that is going to go back to the mainframe and query the data in the mainframe and give you the result back. So you have essentially enabled yourself through reads and writes and updates. Uh, these are the critical operations that, you know, you would want to be able to do once you are developing new functionality, right? Using mainframe as, using your legacy as a backend. Um, 
and then you develop your new functionality into in, in a container-based PaaS platform and provide the value to the business that they need. Uh, and again, imagine you're not telling the business that we are doing a massive rewrite of the mainframe. You know, everybody has said that 10 years ago that we are retiring mainframe. And here we are, the mainframes are still around. Uh, you know, legacy systems are still around. Uh, but by doing, uh, by, by, by taking an iterative approach such as this, you isolate yourself from the changes that will happen or continue to happen in the mainframe slash monolith uh, application and and con and start to deliver new business value to the business, right? Um, you're not telling them I'm, I'm shutting down that system and I'm retiring that system. Everybody will laugh at you. Um, the second step is now that we are at a point that we are now delivering new functionality to the business by enabling these integration points and developing in the new paradigm, um, now suddenly we can actually take one piece at a time and deploy that as a microservice as part of our regular release. So if let's say there's a customer feature in the mainframe, like, okay, give me all the customers or update the customer or create customer. We can actually model that as a microservice now and move that entire set of functionality into one or more set of microservices that are vertically aligned and stop using mainframe for any customer needs anymore. So we will still use mainframe for other needs, but let's say for a customer, then we will go to the microservices. Similarly, you know, we can do this for orders, we can do this for, you know, health records, we can do this for patients, you know, you, you get the picture that you now can actually take feature by feature and start porting into the new world because you have essentially made yourself independent in terms of, you know, latching on to, you are not dependent on mainframe slash monolithic system release cycles anymore, right? And eventually, let's say, I mean, if 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 um, we get to that point, you can potentially look at retiring the mainframe, um, no pun intended. Um, third, um, type of pattern is what I call uh, rewrite based modernization. And this is sometimes necessary because we have systems that are end of life that are have written such a long time back that there's no way that anybody's familiar with it. So people don't know how to change it anymore. The, the next step or the, the only step forward is for us to start to rewrite it. Uh, let's say the platform that is running on is going out of end of life. Uh, vendor is not going to support that anymore. You know, uh, Solaris, let's say if, if you're running in Solaris or if you're running in something that is going out of support, then you have to get out. You have no choice, right? So if you find yourself in this kind of paradigm, uh, obviously this is a hard situation to deal with. But the structured way to, to deal with is, um, you know, what we recommend is um, uh, may, uh, develop feature parity. So instead of just saying that I'm going to start rewriting, you know, uh, the new system. Uh, what we recommend is uh, just make a list of features that are critical to the business uh, that in in the old world uh, in this, and then start mapping those features into the new world of microservices based uh, cloud native applications. So if you had 10 features that the business wants to use from this, make sure that those 10 features are implemented. So you sort of achieve the feature parity. The reason this is important is because it's easy to start writing new systems, but it's hard to finish. The, you know, because of scope creep, because of new things that the business continue to request. So once you start writing, or once you announce that I'm writing a new system, you know, everybody, uh, you know, guess what? Uh, you know, everybody's gonna come and say, can you do mobile integration for me? Can you do Salesforce for me? Can you, you know, give me this report? You know, can you do X? You know, so you will continue to receive new requests. That's the reality of life. But now what you're doing is that you're making an explicit decision. You're saying that, yes, I will add a new feature, but I also have to maintain the feature parity. So maybe I will port five features from the older one and uh, add five new features in this one, in this release cycle, and then the next release cycle, and then the next release cycle. And that's how you can more structurally, you know, approach the retirement of the older system so you can actually prioritize what makes more sense for your business needs whether adding new functionality or retiring you can optimize for that and that becomes very important so let's see how these uh, patterns actually compare with each other um, 
as I said, that generally people think that rewrite is the easiest one, but um, what we have found is the rewrite is easier to get started, but very hard to finish uh, because of the things that I just described. Um, lift and shift turns out to be the easiest to finish, uh, faster to finish, uh, because what you're doing is that you are not actually making any application changes um, in the first cut. You are actually lifting the binaries and deploying them into a new paradigm and enabling yourself towards you know, further modernization as a result of it. So lift and shift can actually give you the best bang for the buck if you have an application that is the best candidate for it. And what we have seen is that augment is one of the more common patterns that apply to plethora of applications uh, because you know there are portions of applications that can be lifted and shifted, but some portions do require you to actually peel the onion and you know take that piece and rewrap it, shrink wrap it, or you know rearchitect it and then deploy it in the new world. So you know um, chances are that. Uh, you, we will see a combination of these patterns to be applied together for one or more systems, and that's going to be the vast majority of it. There is going to be a class of systems that will be a, a good candidate for rewrite, but the whole idea is that we, you know, on on the on the scale of cost of migration and time, we can see that how these patterns play out and divide our portfolio in such a way that we can prioritize for the first one. So perhaps when we start marching towards modernization and we have inventoried the system, um, you know, uh, we can actually make some educated decisions. Um, so one of the key questions is um, what does what does the what does that roadmap look like? Um, so if we have a portfolio of applications and now we have to move forward across, let's say, hundreds of applications, um, you know, what 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 roadmap can we suggest? So this is obviously. Um, a generic roadmap that uh, I present to the customers, but the whole idea is that we sit down with the customers and develop this specific roadmap for their own needs. So as you can see, um, the starting point usually for lift and shift is a customer coming from non-open source middleware applications. These are your applications that are running in um, you know, your proprietary stack. Uh, so the first step that we recommend is enable yourself on the open source. So get onto Red Hat, JBoss stack if you are not using it because first of all we have cleanly architected JBoss portfolio to be nimble and cloud ready right um, and you get the benefit of paying less because we are a lot more affordable than your other vendors and just within chances are that we will be fraction of your maintenance cost even um, so just for that thing alone it's worth the price of the ticket. It's worth the price of admission, right? Uh, so that's the first step that we recommend. Then uh, the next step is usually to set up a container platform such as OpenShift in the environment, in a non-prod environment, in a lab type of environment so that we can uh, train the team, we can get the hands wet, uh, we can see what the what that looks like, develop the development workflows, uh, CICD type of pipeline, put that infrastructure in place. And then the march toward the desired state where we actually identify the applications and start putting them towards this new architecture. Uh, and similarly for the augment piece, uh, generally the customer is coming from mainframe type of applications or monolith applications. Um, the first step as I described is to enable them to create those integration points um, using let's say Fuse stack or some other integration technology just so that you can expose the data and features. Um, and once that is done, you know, get in get yourself enabled on a container platform such as OpenShift because that is going to be the key for us to move forward and then start developing your applications. And similarly for the rewrite, you know, uh, chances are that, you know, you are dealing with a monolith or mainframe type of application that is about to be retired. Um, we will work with you to develop the feature parity, uh, the list of features and keep, uh, develop a capability mapping from where you are and where you want to go. Uh, we will uh, then set up and train uh, with the, uh, you know, uh, set up hands-on workshop so that you can actually uh, decide which technologies, which open source technologies you want to go forward with. Uh, and part of that is to develop cloud native uh, application, uh, you know, as part of your effort. Uh, we are also, work, you know, we, we also have some tools um, that are at our disposal um, that we have developed. Um, you know, as part of our consulting effort 
that is now available generally. So the, our methodology is that we will we sit down with the customers and uh, catalog the applications and start categorizing them in different buckets. Um, and the way we do that is we have a tool called Windup and we conduct a set of workshops. So Windup uh, traditionally has been used to identify key points for uh, migrating applications from WebLogic, WebSphere, or any other uh, Java container to Red Hat JBoss stack. We are now enhancing Windup to also analyze the application so that it can tell you how much your application is a good candidate for being cloud native or go cloud ready, how, cl how much cloud ready it is. So we actually assign a score as part of this. And the result of that is we get a very good indication, a starting indication that, you know, this application could be a good candidate for lift and shift versus augment versus, you know, something else. Um, and we, we use that data to basically develop a plan um, of action. And that plan encompasses your entire portfolio and gives us very good starting points in terms of, uh, you know, how we actually proceed forward. And, uh, you know, this is a structured approach that we can put in place as a result of that. So, um, you know, we have started to field test this already with a lot of our customers and we are seeing good results, as, you know, with this approach. And uh, we are continuing to move forward with this, especially, you know, the, the, the initial challenge, challenges were when we have a massive portfolio of applications, uh, how do we actually deal with that? And how do we actually, you know, put some structure around it? So we, we, we now have a methodology, we have a roadmap, and we also have a set of tools that we use. Um, uh, so um, there are some real life examples that I wanted to show you. So this is an example of a real life customer that had a very large web application. And the problem that they were going through was uh, uh, at the time of uh, Black Friday, they their servers, froze and they they had no I, no way to actually add more capacity so we actually worked with them uh, using the lift and shift and we were able to deploy some key components in uh, the container based platform that allowed them to scale very fast um, secondly there's a middleware application with a huge data in in a mainframe uh, and uh, this this customer um, um, for the challenge was the, the 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 user sessions were equal to the DB connections. So if if it reaches a certain point, you know, and the, there are no da more database connections available, then the system came to a complete halt. And in this particular case, uh, we applied an augment pattern. Uh, we introduced. Uh, they, we actually took the features and 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 ported them into microservices layer, and, and introduced database caching uh, as a result of that. Um, and the and, and then we moved from, you know, uh, five less than 50 concurrent requests to, uh, you know, more than 5,000. You know, uh, it, it was a ridiculously large number. And the whole idea is that we actually applied this pattern and were able to quickly move forward with it. Um, uh, one of the key things that I just want to highlight over here is that we have a very structured approach to deal with this. Um, we generally start with a discovery workshop, which is generally, you know, at no charge but then we engage with our customers in the design workshop that we you know uh, remember when i showed you the slide that has the list of applications and the, we categorize them and we run the wind up analysis and then we make a plan that's what the design workshop is and then eventually you know we work with you uh, to scale up uh, in terms of migration and modernization so it's it's really a no big bang approach very very structured very flexible um you know so we we have been doing this for you know past two two and a half years now uh, in a, with very very successfully um, before we put this structure in place you know we had mixed success uh, mixed results but now we have fine-tuned our process to actually hone in on using this as a very structured approach moving forward so that brings me to the end of my slide deck and um, I thank you for there, there are some other slides that I, I just don't want to talk about because um, there are too many details. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions at this point though. So Diane, back to you. Uh, if, if you see any questions at this point or anything that you want me to address.
Diana, I think you are on mute. So let me um, let me start to take a look at some questions here. Do these migration paths have security implications or challenges? Uh, so very good question. Uh, we try to uh, work within the same security confines of the customer. So for example, if we talk about different levels of security, if they have single sign-on, if they have uh, procedures for network security, firewalls and stuff like that, uh, we try to work within those same confines. Um, if the customer is also moving to the cloud as part of this effort, um, and traditionally they, they have not been part of the cloud, then obviously those security con concerns have to be evaluated as part of this migration effort. Uh, but, you know, uh, generally, you know, uh, I, you know, I have not seen the security considerations change. Um, what, what happens is that when we move to the container-based paradigm, um, you know, uh, the customers are not sure how to, uh, you know, security scan those or how to, patch those and those are the new set of processes that we we put in place so uh yes there are some additions and so there are new things as part of this but um uh generally you know the the security infrastructure and the generally the security stuff um uh, you know we try to work within those confines um another question is um ideas on how to convince customer to get to these paths clarify ROI. Um, you know, frankly, uh, if the customer is not already thinking about modernization, then um, I don't know if, if, you know, maybe this is the type of customer who has really not thought through, uh, you know, about moving forward into any kind of cloud-based architecture yet. So if we have that type of a customer uh, and they have not thought about it, then, you know, this Usually, you know what I what I see is that they have this this thing at the back of their head, but um, they don't know how to get started. And when we present this, you know, the, the general feedback that I get is, yes, you know, this is a very structured approach, and we actually can work with you on this. Um, but you know, um, if the customer has not decided to move to the cloud for various reasons, um, then this could be just the catalyst that they need. Um, you know, I have seen several customers who are traditionally on the fence and, um, you know, they they haven't moved forward for various reasons. But when we give them this kind of approach, which is smaller to start and, you know, can scale up according to their needs, they feel much comfortable. Uh, I wish I had a general answer for you, but, you know, in this case, it depends on customer to customer. Um, ROI. Uh, I mean, ROI, uh, you know, we are not recommending a big bang approach. We are recommending, you know, get started small and even tackle just the lift and shift class of applications. So that way the customers can see the benefit of lift and shift right away. Um, you know, just I'm I'm talking about in some cases even less than three months where we have actually successfully moved the workload from non-container-based to container-based environment very, very quickly. And that has allowed customer to realize the dev workflow automation, you know, and efficiencies in standing up multiple environments quickly. So um, when we develop the roadmap with them, we try to maximize with the quickest wins first. And I think that's where the ROIs uh, can be adjusted or fine-tuned for the customer needs. Diane, do you think do you, do you see any specific questions that we that you want me to address? I'm just going through that list right now. Hi guys, I've lost my network connection multiple times the past few minutes, and you've handled it very nicely, Zoe. So um, thank you. Um, Um, do you have a plan to ensure that ch changes to one microservice don't affect other services that depend on it? 
Uh, this seems to be difficult when you aren't always sure who's using your service and how. So great question. So uh, we, we just don't blindly move stuff to microservices. We actually use uh, methodologies from the Wayne Devon design to model what are the bounded contexts and define those bounded contexts and use that as our um, you know, transaction boundary or process boundary or microservices boundary to move functionality from the legacy to the new paradigm or cloud native paradigm. So you're absolutely right. Like if, if you are not careful, then you can end up with microservice that can act same as monolith because of the dependencies. So the whole idea is that when you actually decide to move something from legacy to microservices, you have to model where is the transaction boundary? What, what are the, your key aggregates that uh, model the system in terms of define the transaction boundary or a typical bounded context? And using that knowledge, uh, you, you then start to port your code or your system into the microservices world. The whole idea is that it, it should be all encompassing so that you should not unnecessarily be crossing the transaction boundaries from one microservice to, to the other. Now, there will be cases where, you know, multiple microservices will depend on each other for data and some other stuff. And that's where we have the, you know, the, uh, event messaging where you have the set of microservices that control the main transaction, but notify the downstream microservices, let's say via event uh, domain events. And that way, you know, you can actually implement a set of systems um, with microservices that are fully independent in their own transaction context, but act as a group when it comes to, you know, key business functionality. So Zoeb, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, cool. Uh, my network has been going up and down, but your recording is perfectly fine and I can hear you. So um, there's a, you've, and I think you've answered most of the questions that are in the, in the chat, um, but there's a good set of um, conversations going here. The entire deck will be made available for everybody who is um, listening to this. Are there any other questions that um, folks have if you pop them in? To the, into the chat, we can continue. Otherwise, um, Zoe, can you put up your um, your final screen with any contact information you might have and how people can reach you and find out more information? Yeah, yeah I can uh, definitely do that. Uh, and I apologize for the, the network. It just decided that it was going on vacation too. So you can reach me on Twitter um, or I have a blog that I write, uh, that I use uh, to write about stuff. So you can check that out. Um, so, so these are the two things that uh, I commonly use um, and you can reach me over there. All right. Well, thanks, Zoe. Um, and I'm glad we got to have this um, presentation today and I'm sure we'll have a few more patterns in the future, but I, I do love the augmented reality one because um, that's, that's the world we all live in, I think. So, right. um, or we're, right. going, we're going to soon. So um, take care, everybody, and we will talk to you all soon. And if you're coming to Berlin, travel safe. That's March 28th. And hopefully you'll get to see um, Zoeb in person. I'm pretty sure he's got sessions at the Red Hat Summit coming up in Boston in May, the 2nd and 3rd. I think you're co-presenting with Verizon there yep. on some of these spaces, so that'll be fun. Um, there'll also be an OpenShift Commons meetup or gathering in on May 1st, the day before Red Hat Summit, and you can register for that now. The Berlin one is sold out.